Stand with me, would you please? And we're reading from Luke chapter 10 this morning, beginning in verse 21. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Father, we are privileged. Question is, are we taking advantage of the privilege? Privilege of having your word available, not just in one version, but in multiple ones, having it readily available probably in multiple copies in our homes, whereas many people around the world have nothing and we let it lie week after week, month after month. Privileged father to live in a country where, well, 73 years ago today, we had the great attack on the integrity and the honor of our country and we had men and women who came to the defense of our country then and come to it still now so that we can enjoy these freedoms that we take for granted. Lord, help us, to be, help us to be serious people, Lord, who joy in the right things and in the right way. So thankful for what you've given us. But with great privilege comes great responsibility. May we remember that and take our responsibility seriously, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, personal note, Trevor, wherever you went, uh, we're having a brief nominating committee meeting today, but I thought you were in Chicago or somewhere, so you're popping up here. I didn't expect to see you, so welcome, good to see you. Uh, if you can make that for a few minutes right after church. December uh, 7th of 2009, wasn't quite as memorable a day as 1941, but... It was the day that Sports Illustrated named Yankee shortstop Derek Jeter the player of the year. Uh, some of you, you don't think that's quite in the same ballpark, I can tell. It's true. For him it was. I'm sure it was a great day. Some of you may have followed his career and may have uh, noticed that uh, when he retired last year, uh, he, put a, he put an exclamation point on the end of his career, game-winning hit in his last game at Yankee Stadium, all these kinds of things. But in this cover story, uh, when he was named Sportsman of the Year, they showed a picture of him walking down a hallway, a long hallway, toward the Yankee dressing room. And as he was walking, the pictures showed him from the back, he's pointing to a sign up above that says, I thank the good Lord for making me a Yankee. Now, if you're a baseball fan, you can probably appreciate that. If not, you may not. But it occurred to me as I read that, I thought, you know what? Believers have something far better to wake up to every morning. I thank the good Lord for making me a Christian. We can't take that for granted, beloved. Thank the good Lord for making me a Christian. It doesn't get any better than that. And as these 72 disciples that Jesus had sent out to represent him in the places that he was going to go, came back, rejoicing at the great success they'd had in their ministry. He rejoiced with them, as you'll recall, but he also pointed them to, if you're going to rejoice, here's the thing you really need to concentrate on, that your name is written in heaven, that you're a Christian. That's where your attention needs to go. But then Luke takes us immediately from that into these verses 21 through 24, well, we get great insight into the mind of the Lord himself. He rejoices. And the word that's used here is just he, he exalts. His, his spirit is just bubbling over. 
And, and this is happening at the same time we know that his heart is heavy, anticipating the death that he's going toward in Jerusalem. He knows what's going to happen, and yet he just rejoices. And I thought as I read that passage, man, if, if Jesus could rejoice knowing what's coming, we ought to look at what it is that causes him in the midst of this extremity, great extremity, worse extremity than you and I will ever face, to be able to rejoice. Because it ought to light our hearts aflame as well with joy in what caused his to be so rejoicing. It's the bedrock of Christian faith that we're going to see in these three things that are here in this passage that Jesus was rejoicing over. The first one, number one, Jesus rejoiced in the sovereign pleasure of the Father. He rejoiced in the sovereign pleasure of the Father. He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and reveal them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Or we could substitute the word pleasure. Such was your gracious pleasure. The first thing we see here is that the sovereignty of God dwarfs the arrogance of men. And beloved, that's important because it's tough sometimes to face the arrogance of those who are unbelievers and who refuse to believe, right? I, 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 just this week, I saw a little tweet of some kind that was basically saying uh, Kurt Schilling, who was, I'm sorry, he's another sports guy, but he was a pitcher. Kurt Schilling had put out a, a thing defend, or, or, or uh, objecting to the theory of evolution, and somebody was basically tweeting and saying, man, what a caveman that guy is. You know what Jesus is rejoicing here in? He's rejoicing that the day is coming when those kind of rights are going to be made, right? those kind of wrongs are going to be made right. The arrogance of those who would dare to pit themselves against the revelation of God and the person of God will be corrected. Those who are wise in their own eyes are going up against, I know it's what, Jesus calls the, the Father there. He calls him Lord of heaven and earth. He's basically saying, you're the Lord of everything. And he's reminding us that those who go against him, who are wise in their own eyes, are going up against the one who created it all. They have no hope of winning. And we ought to rejoice in that. Those who deny his creative Genius will one day find that he has hidden himself from them. It's an amazing thing. Those of us, we were just talking about it in Sunday school today, but those of us who have come to faith in Christ and have seen the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel, and it's amazing to us that others cannot see that. The beauty of the gospel would be hidden, but it's hidden from those who arrogantly pit themselves against God who believe themselves to be more wise than his wisdom expressed in his word, who would dare to take a stand against him. Jesus says, yes, Father, for such was your gracious will to hide yourself from those. Everything will ultimately be against, according to God's will, and Jesus is overcome at the thought that those who will humble themselves before him can be saved, those who arrogantly pit themselves against him will be condemned. Jesus rejoiced in that even though he knew that there was gonna be a great price for him to pay so that the will of God and the sovereignty of God could be fully and completely expressed. But he reveled in the fact that that's what will happen, that will be the case. God will come out on top, it's inevitable. The great thing is, it's not just God's just will, however, in this passage that Jesus rejoices in. It's his gracious will. His will is full of grace. His will is full of opportunity. His will is full of the possibility of us coming to him. And if we will humble ourselves before him, we can have the salvation that he provides in Christ. If it was just the just will of the Father, we'd all be dead by now, wouldn't we? Be over with. It's his gracious will that Jesus rejoices in. 
Now he makes this statement that we have to deal with. He says, the gospel is hidden from the wise and revealed to little children. So what does that mean? Does that mean that if you got an IQ over, you know, 100, you're out? Does that mean that if you had a PhD, you're, it's, it's hopeless, you can just as well phone it in, or that if no geniuses need apply here, is that what Jesus is getting at, that Christianity is, is only for the dim-witted? Well, even if that were true, I would say, count me in. But that's not the point. We know that there were brilliant men who have come to faith in Christ. The Apostle Paul was one of the wisest men in human knowledge of his age, and yet he became a follower of Christ. Luke was a medical doctor. He became a follower of Christ. You don't have to put your brain on the shelf to become a follower of Christ. So what does it mean? We could go to a lot of passages to get the answer, but let me just give you one. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 12. Let me just read it. Proverbs 26 and verse 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? Do you see a man who would pit his wisdom against God's? Do you see a man who rejects the revelation of God because it doesn't accord with his view of the world? Do you see a person who says, God can't be like this because this is the way I want him to be? Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? Then in that case, the Bible says there is more hope for a fool than for him. The issue is not IQ. The issue is recognizing that God is smarter than I am. Jesus is talking about people here who think that they have all the answers versus those who know that they don't. And so they're willing to trust in a God who does. They're willing to listen to him. We don't have to be stupid to be a Christian, but you do have to come to the place where you, where you submit to the greater wisdom and authority and mind and will of God. If you will not do that, there is no hope. If you will not submit to him, if you will not surrender to him, if you will not determine to obey him, there is no hope. You are not wiser than God. And if you insist that you are, he will show himself greater by hiding himself from you. That's what this passage is teaching. The wise and the understanding, those who want to leave God out of the equation, will one day find that wisdom is really found in the fear of the Lord. In fact, there is no wisdom. In fact, the Bible says the, beginning, the, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? You can't even, forget about getting way out there. You can't even get to the beginning of wisdom until you come to the fear of the Lord. You can have a lot of knowledge from a human perspective, but true wisdom starts with the fact that there is God and that God counts. If you will not come there and bow the knee to him, you cannot know him. Human wisdom makes up its own rules and then tragically it obeys them. A very famous talk show host wrote an autobiography in which he says this. He says, if God the Father is so all loving, why didn't he come and go to Calvary? Then Jesus could have said, this is my Father in whom I am well pleased. How can an all-knowing, all-loving God allow his Son to be murdered on a cross in order that he might redeem my sins? I'm sure that that man thought that was a clever question. <laughs> my, th my thinking is he didn't even think it through. Or he would have realized what's harder, to be the one who dies or to be the one who sent your own son to death. You tell me. But the bigger issue is, here's a man who's saying whatever the Bible says, if it doesn't accord with my view of how life ought to be, I don't believe it. And so God is hidden from him. I don't know if he's changed since he wrote that. I hope he has. But until we'll humble ourselves before God, we will not know him. 
The gospel is for those who will come as babes, not the IQ challenged, but those who will come as babes, those who will understand that his wisdom is greater than mine and who will say, this is what God has said, I believe it. Those are the ones who will prevail. Those are the ones who one day will have eternal life. You know, this is what God expresses many times. Mary's wonderful prayer in Luke 1, verse 52, she says, He, God, has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Just like her son Jesus would do later. She, re, she revels in the fact that God is sovereign and that those who, those who exalt themselves will be brought down, that those who are humble will be exalted. Paul asks in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 20, he says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? This is a principle that plays out over and over in scripture. You remember, remember Esther? Remember the story of Esther? How she saves her people from the destruction that was about to come upon them? Well, there's a subplot in that book that you may be familiar with. The Persian king Ahasuerus had exalted and uh, promoted one of his trusted advisors, Haman, to the number two position in the country. Haman loved that. And everybody kowtowed to Haman, and he reveled in that. Everybody except one Jewish man named Mordecai who said, I can't. I can't bow down to Haman because of my respect for Jehovah, and so he refused to bow. This made Haman absolutely furious. He went to the king and he got an edict that all the Jewish people in the land convinced him that all the Jewish people were bad. It's not, Hitler wasn't the first one, right? <laughs> convinced him all the Jewish people were bad. You got to kill them off. And so the king issued an edict that on such and such a day that would happen. He did that all just to get one guy. But he couldn't wait. He can't sleep one night. He's so furious. He's just raging. And he thinks, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a scaffold built and I'm going I'm to hang that guy Haman tomorrow. I'm not going to wait. But meantime, the king also had a sleepless night. And the king decided to have the court journals brought in and read to him. You know, what better way to go to sleep, right? So they brought the journals in and they began to read to him. But in the process, they read how this Jewish man named Mordecai had uncovered a plot to kill the king a few months before and had saved the king's life. And he hadn't been properly rewarded yet. So the king thought, I'm going to fix that. Tomorrow, I'm going to take care of that. So the next day, Haman got up and he got his scaffold built and he came running into the king. But before he could say anything, the king said to him, hey, Haman, I got a question for you. He said, what do you think the king ought to do for somebody that he really is pleased with? You think God doesn't have a sense of humor? I mean, you haven't read this stuff yet, right? What do you think he ought to do? Of course, Haman is thinking, oh, the king wants to honor me. So he pulls out all the stops with his answer, right? He says, well, listen, yeah, ta hey, take one of your royal horses and seat him on that and give him, give him a royal purple robe and let one of your crowns be set on his head and have somebody, you know, one of your key guys, take him through the streets and proclaim that the king honors this man. That's what you ought to do for him. The king says, right, great idea. I want that done for Mordecai. See to it, Haman. <laughs> and that's how Haman found himself, instead of hanging Mordecai, dragging him through the street on the king's horse, proclaiming how much the king loved him. Of course, that was just the beginning. That night at a banquet that the queen had arranged, Haman somehow fell. I don't know whether he'd been drinking too much or what. The Bible doesn't really tell us, but he fell on the queen's couch while the queen was on the queen's couch. And the king looked over and figured, this guy's assaulting my queen. Who does he think he is? And the next thing you know, Haman is the one hanging from the gallows instead of Mordecai. What's the point? God exalts the humble and resists the proud. That's a caution for all of us, is it not? Believer or unbeliever. But of course, the, gracious, the greatest caution is to those who continue to reject Christ, think they can do it their own way, think that somehow they're going to get by. 
instead of humbling themselves and seeking him. The Bible says if you seek me with all your heart, it doesn't say if you seek me with half your heart, you will find me. It's those who will seek him with all their heart that will find him. But he hides from those who are wise in their own conceits. That's the Lord's sovereignty. That's his right. That's his will. And Jesus rejoiced in it. So should we. It should be something we rejoice in. Now, beloved, you can't do anything about the sovereignty of God, but you can do something about the pride in your own heart. James 4, verse 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. It is his gracious will to save you and to save me and to save all who will come to him humbly. But it is his sovereign determination to judge those who will not. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. The gospel's on the bottom shelf, beloved, but it will be hidden from you, from me, from anybody who refuses to come to God humbly. Submitting ourselves to his grace and submitting ourselves to the revelation of himself in his word. Jesus rejoiced in that. So can we. Secondly, Jesus rejoiced in the supreme power of the Son. He rejoiced in the supreme power of the Son. That's in verse 22. Luke 10, 22, he says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father or who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. You know, I read a passage like that and and I wonder if you don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, what in the world do you do with a passage like that? I mean, think about it. Think about the context in which this was said. There in front of you stands a very ordinary looking man. Isaiah 53, 2 tells us that. Jesus wasn't extraordinary in his looks. A very ordinary looking man. His hair is windblown. He's been out on the road. His feet and sandals are covered with the dust of the road. His hands are undoubtedly, you know, pockmarked a little bit like everybody's would be in those days from whatever scratches they had run into on the road. His beard is growing. Sweat is running down his brow. And he says, that man says, if you don't know me, you don't know the Father. If you don't believe in me, you don't know God. I mean, how can you, how can you say that unless you're, unless you're a lunatic and ready for the loony bin unless it's true? People say Jesus didn't claim to be God. Jesus claimed to be God on every page of Scripture. He knew who he was. But there were a lot of people that couldn't understand it. Now listen, Carefully, beloved, this doesn't mean that people don't believe that there is a God. You can believe that there is a God without believing in Jesus Christ. He's revealed, he's revealed himself in creation. He's revealed himself in the moral conscience. It's in all of our hearts. You can believe in that there is a God without Christ, but you can't have a saving knowledge of God without knowing Christ. Without acknowledging his deity, that's impossible. That's why the supreme blessing of knowing God is a closed book to those who are wise in their own understanding. Those who say, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Christ. Those who are wise in their own conceits, they reject the Son and thus reject the Father. Think about it for a moment. If, 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 if Jesus really is God come in the flesh to die for your sins and mine, and then we turn around and say, well, I accept the Father who sent him, but I don't believe in him. We're, we're, we're separating the Trinity if this is all true. You can't, you can't know God if you're trying to separate him in, in half like that. This, and, and this is a rock 
bottom requirement for salvation. This is, where the, this is where the Bible says, this is if there's anything you must believe and commit to, this is it. You can only believe in and come through Jesus Christ for salvation. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. They are one. You reject Christ and you've rejected the Father. Do you see? You, you can't have one without the other. You may believe in God, but he's a God of your own making. He's a, he's a, he, he's a God only in your mind. He's your God. He's God in your image. He's not the true God. Because the true God is triune. And one of the persons of the Trinity of this God who is one in essence was the person of Jesus Christ. That's why you can only know the true God through Jesus. He reveals himself to those who will hum themselves before him and who will repent and who will make a new master in their life. Listen, God doesn't do passing acquaintances. You can't just come along and say, well, okay, hey, God, have a nice day. See you later. It doesn't work that way. This is a lifetime commitment that we can only come to through the person of Jesus Christ because he's the one who paid the debt for our sins. Jesus never said it plainer than in John 17, three, when he said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You gotta take them together, can't separate them. Isaiah knew this long ago. He said in Isaiah 53, verse 10, he summarizes the life of Christ. He said, yet it was the will of the Lord, Jehovah, to crush him, the Messiah who was coming. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When? When his soul makes an offering for guilt. But here's where the resurrection is, even in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, 10. He says, after he's crushed him, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. How can you do that if you're not alive? The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus rejoices that the Lord's will is being done and he rejoices in, this, in the sovereignty that God has given him to make a way for life for those who will believe. Even though it's gonna cost him dearly, he rejoices in that. But it's, he's the only way. Students were in a paramedic class, right? And the instructor was training them. You got to keep doing these chest compressions until, you know, help arise, but you got to keep doing this. Well, they start doing it. And one of the students realized, whoa, this could get exhausting after a while. He says uh, to the instructor, he says, sir, what do we, what do, we do if, we, you know, if we get tired and we, just, and we can't keep it up? Do we call 911? And the instructor looked at him and he said, son, you are 911. Nobody else to call here. Those who would believe and teach that there's some other way of salvation other than the, to the Christ who has died to pay for our sins, where does that come from? Certainly not through God's revealed word, right? It comes only through the mind of men who have pitted themselves against the wisdom of God and said, I know more. No, you don't. There's only one way. No one else is co-equal with the Father. No one else died for our sins. No one else has made provision. Just one way. It's him or nothing. Jesus rejoiced that God had made a way. Finally, Jesus rejoiced in one other thing, the surpassing privilege of the saints. The surpassing privilege of the saints. Verse 23, having expressed his joy to the Father, he says this, it says, then turning to the disciples, he said privately, you guys are really blessed. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, and they didn't see it to hear what you hear, and they didn't hear it. This is a powerful statement of the unsurpassed privilege of those who are in Christ. 
Jesus is saying, listen, kings in ancient times who were complete masters of their realm could have everything they wanted, weren't as privileged as you guys are. Prophets who spoke the very word of God to people who came along and said, I'm representing God to you. They weren't as blessed as you guys are. They longed to see what you now see and they longed to hear what you now hear. You are highly privileged people. Old Testament prophets and sometimes kings like David and Solomon spoke the very words of God, right, according to the Bible. They were given words from God, sometimes that they understood and sometimes not. Daniel interpreted a lot of dreams for the great Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, that had come from God. He interpreted them, he knew what they meant and he told Nebuchadnezzar what they meant. Then he got some dreams of his own. And sometimes he didn't know what they meant and God sent an angel to tell him. And then as they got increasingly complex toward the end, God told him, okay, Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verse eight, Daniel says this, I heard, but I did not understand. So he says, this time I said, oh Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the end of time. Daniel wanted more. God said, enough for now. That's all you get. Think what the people of Jesus' time didn't understand when he came. Think what they didn't understand when he came. They knew there was a Messiah coming, they knew that. But they did not know that when he came, he was going to have, be a person who had a pre-existence before time began, didn't know that. They didn't know that he was gonna be God in the flesh. They didn't know that. There's nothing in the rabbinic writings that indicate they had any knowledge of that. They couldn't reconcile the suffering Messiah of Isaiah chapters 40 through 66 with the great and mighty and powerful Messiah that they saw in other places in scripture. And so they just, they just ignored the suffering part. They knew that there was gonna have to be a sacrifice for sin of some kind, but they never dreamed that the sacrifice would be made by God himself on their behalf after he spent 30 years keeping his own law perfectly on their behalf so that they could become the righteousness of God in him. They didn't know that. They didn't see that there would be not one but two comings of Christ, one in humility, and service, at which time he would die for the sins of the world. And a second one in power and glory and judgment when he would finalize the promised kingdom, when he would culminate history, when he would bring an end to all the sin and misery and evil and wickedness. and Set up a kingdom that will last forever. How Moses and Elijah and Daniel and Abraham and David all, how they would have loved to have known all this. They didn't know all this. They got it in bits and pieces. They saw it, you know, they saw it in shadowy form. It was kind of like being handled, handed a, you know, pair of binoculars and you look out through the binoculars and they're not focused and you see some big shape out there and and if you watch closely, you see, oh, it it moved just a little bit. There must be some kind of life out there, but you don't, you know, you don't have no clue. Is that a, is that a Mack truck or is that King Kong? you You don't know, you can't tell. And then somebody shows you how to focus the binoculars in, right? And so you begin to turn the knobs and you you begin to focus and the closer you get, the more you see, oh yeah. And and, and then pretty soon it becomes crystal clear and you say, oh, it's Mike Hungenberg. That's who I'm seeing out there. And you focus a little more and you go, oh, he didn't even shave today. Surprise there. But you know, now you can see it all. This is what it was like when Jesus came. He's, what, what, what is he doing up until, the, the whole time that he's here on earth, up until the time of his resurrection, he's, he's turning the knobs and he's focusing things in so that by the time he's done, what they could not see, what they could see only in just bits and pieces and shadowy form became crystal clear now. What a privilege to live on this side of the cross, isn't it? We now know that the Messiah who came was God in the flesh. We now know that he came so that he could die to pay for our sins. We now know that he rose again from the dead. We now know that he ascended back to the Father and we know that he's coming again. If he did the first three, he's gonna get the fourth one done, don't you think? He's coming again. 
and we can see it all with crystal clarity. What a privilege. Turn to 1 Peter, you know, almost to the end of the Bible. 1 Peter 1. Peter talks about this. He recognized, he realized what a privilege he had, you know, and, and, and you got to give Peter credit because he was one of the ones that was hardest for this to get through to, right? Struggled with it. But look what he says in 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 10. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. They worked at it. They were inquiring what person, person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. They just, they just couldn't fit all the pieces together. By verse 12, it was re revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. Imagine even the angels didn't understand all this stuff, but now we do. And Jesus is ecstatic that it's about to all happen. Everything that he came for, everything that he was, that this whole plan of God had, had been created way back before the beginning of time was aimed at, it was all about to happen. And after years, hundreds of years, and thousands of years of mystery, the plan of salvation and redemption was about to be made plain. His followers were the most privileged people on the planet because they were seeing it played out, and Jesus reveled in that. What a, what a privilege we have in Christ. Michelle Anthony, <clears throat> in her book called Spiritual Parenting, which I commend to any of you who are parents, she tells of writing out a statement for her children based on Ephesians 1. She wanted her children, you know, we got to do behavior modification at times, right? And, and you, you have to do that. And you apply the principles that will allow that to happen. And it's appropriate to do that. The Bible instructs us to do that. But, but, but the Bible also teaches we got to get to the heart somewhere along the line. Only God can do the heart work, but we can kind of plow the ground and that's what she was trying to do when she came up with this idea. She said, I, she went, I wanted to write a statement based on Ephesians 1 to remind my children who they are and what they have in Christ so that when the temptations come to do the things that are incongruous with this position in Christ, they would at least recognize this is not who you are. She was doing it, and essentially, I think, she was doing this Christian equivalent of I want to thank the good Lord for making me a Yankee, right? Here's what we should thank God for. Here's how this statement read. You substitute your name. Statement read like this. My name is Dave or John or Patty or Chris or whatever your, your name is. My name is Dave. I am the chosen and adopted son of the Most High King. I'm the heir to an eternal inheritance waiting for me in heaven. I have been bought and completely paid for by the perfect sacrifice of Christ's own blood. And then I have been sealed throughout all eternity by God's Holy Spirit. Don't mess with me. I like the ending. Don't mess with me. <laughs> this is who I am in Christ. You may not like my looks. You may not like how I do certain things. You may not like my faith. I don't really care. I belong to Jesus Christ. Then get better than that, beloved. No better than that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you've died and paid for for us. If this caused your heart to rejoice, how it should cause our heart to rejoice. Not perfect, but moving in that direction. Sinning and yet <clears throat> forgiven. Saved not by my own works, but by grace. 
just longing for you to work a little faster, Lord, if anything, to work a little faster. But thank you that you're at work. Thank you you've never given up. Thank you that in you I have everything I will ever, ever need. Lord, this is your message to us this morning. Please do what I can't do. Take it and apply it to the hearts of those who are here. By your Holy Spirit, do the heart work that will change us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.